Chapter Eleven of Jeremy by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Merry-Go-Round. One. The holidays were over. The Coles were once more back in Polchester, and the most exciting period of Jeremy's life had begun. So, at any rate, he felt it it might be that in later years there would be new exciting events lion hunting for instance or a war or the tracking of niggers in the heart of africa he would be ready for them when they came but these last weeks before his first departure for school offered him the prospect of the first real independence of his life there could never be anything quite like that again nevertheless school seems still a long way distant it was only his manliness that he was realizing and a certain impatience and restlessness that underlay everything that he did september and october are often very lovely months in polchester autumn seems to come there with a greater warmth and richness than it does elsewhere along all the reaches of the pole right down to the sea the leaves of the woods hung with a riotous magnificence that is glorious in its recklessness the waters of that silent river are so still so glassy that the banks of gold and flaming red are reflected in all their richest colour down into the very heart of the stream and it is only when a fish jumps or a twig falls from the overhanging trees that the mirror is broken and the colours flash into ripples and shadows of white and grey the utter silence of all this world makes the cathedral town sleepy sluggish forgotten of all men as the autumn comes it seems to drowse away into winter to the tune of its cathedral bells to the scent of its burning leaves and the soft steps of its canons and clergy there is every autumn here a clerical conference and long before the appointed week begins and long after it is lawfully concluded clergymen strange clergymen with soft black hats take the town for their own gaze into martin the pastry-cooks sit in the dusk of the cathedral listening to the organ walk their heads in air their arms folded behind their backs straight up orange street as though they were scaling heaven itself stop little children pat their heads and give them pennies stand outside poole's bookshop and delve in the twopence box for thumb-marked sermons stand gazing in learned fashion at the great west door investigating the saints and apostles portrayed thereon hurry in their best hats and coats along the close to some lady's tea-party or pass with solemn and anxious mien into the palace of the bishop himself all these things belong to autumn in polchester as jeremy very well knew but the event that marks the true beginning of the season the only way by which you may surely know that summer is over and autumn is come is pauper's fair this famous fair has been from time immemorial a noted event in glebeshire life even now when fairs have yielded to cinematographs as attractions for the people pauper's fair gives its annual excitement thirty years ago it was the greatest event of the year in polchester all our fine people of course disliked it extremely it disturbed the town for days the town rocked in the arms of crowds of drunken sailors the town gave shelter to gypsies and rogues and scoundrels the town the decent amiable happy town actually for a week or so seemed to invite the world of the blazing fire and the dancing clown no wonder that our fine people shuddered only the other day i speak now of these modern times the bishop tried to stop the whole business he wrote to the glebeshire morning news urging that pauper's fair in these days of enlightenment and culture cannot but be regretted by all those who have the healthy progress of our dear country at heart well you would be amazed at the storm that his protest raised people wrote from all over the county and there were ultimately letters from patriotic glebeshire citizens in new zealand and south africa and in polchester itself every one even those who had shuddered most at the fair's iniquities was indignant give up the fair one of the few signs left of that jolly old england whose sentiment is cherished by us whose fragments nevertheless we so readily stamp upon 
no the fair must remain and will remain i have no doubt until the very end of our national chapter nowadays it has shed very largely i am afraid the character that it gloriously maintained thirty years ago then it was really an invasion by the seafaring element of the county all the little country ports and harbours poured out their fishermen and sailors who came walking driving singing laughing swearing they filled the streets and went peering like the wildest of ancient picks into the mysterious beauties of the cathedral and late at night when the town should have slept arm in arm they went roaring past the dark windows singing their songs stamping their feet and every once and again ringing a decent doorbell for their amusement it was very seldom that any harm was done once a serious fire broke out amongst the old wooden houses down on the river and some of them were burnt to the ground a fate that no one deplored once a sailor was murdered in a drunken squabble at the dog and pilchard the wildest of the riverside hostelries and once a cannon was caught and stripped and ducked in the waters of the pole by a mob who resented his gentle appeals that they should try to prefer lemonade to gin but these were the only three catastrophes in all the history of the fair during the fair week the town sniffed of the sea of lobster and seaweed and tar and brine and all the tales of the sea that have ever been told by man were told during these days in polchester the decent people kept their doors locked their children at home and their valuables in the family safe no upper-class child in polchester so much as saw the outside of a gypsy van the dean's earnest was accustomed to boast that he had once been given a ride by a gypsy on a donkey when his nurse was not looking but no one credited the story and the details with which he supported it were feeble and unconvincing the polchester children in general were told that they would be stolen by the gypsies if they weren't careful and although some of them in extreme moments of rebellion and depression felt that the life of adventure thus offered to them might after all be more agreeable than the dreary realism of their natural days the warning may be said to have been effective no family in polchester was guarded more carefully in this matter of the pauper's fare than the cole family mr cole had an absolute horror of the fare sailors and gypsies were to him the sign and seal of utter damnation and although he tried as a christian clergyman to believe that they deserved pity because of the disadvantages under which they had from the first laboured he confessed to his intimate friends that he saw very little hope for them either in this world or the next jeremy helen and mary were during fair week kept severely within doors their exercise had to be taken in the coal garden and the farthest that they poked their noses into the town was their visit to st john's on sunday morning except on one famous occasion the fair week of jeremy's fifth year saw him writhing under a terrible attack of toothache which became after two agonized nights such a torment and distress to the whole household that he had to be conveyed to the house of mr pilter who had his torture chamber at number three market square it is true that jeremy was conveyed thither in a cab and that his pain and his darkened windows prevented him from seeing very much of the gay world nevertheless in spite of the jam-pot who guarded him like a dragon he caught a glimpse of flags a gleaming brass band and a punch and judy show and he heard the trumpets and the drum and the shouts of excited little boys and the blowing of the punch and judy pipes and he smelt roasting chestnuts bad tobacco and beer and gin he returned young as he was and reduced to a corpse-like condition by the rough but kindly intentioned services of mr pilcher with the picture of a hysterical abandoned world clearly imprinted upon his brain i want to go he said to the jampot you can't said she i will when i'm six said he you won't said she i will when i'm seven said he you won't said she i will when i'm eight he answered oh give over do master jeremy said she 
and now he was eight very nearly nine and going to school in a fortnight there seemed to be a touch of destiny about his prophecy two he had no intention of disobedience had he been once definitely told by someone in authority that he was not to go to the fair he would not have dreamt of going he had no intention of disobedience but he had returned from the cow farm holiday in a strange condition of mind he had found there this summer more freedom than he had been ever allowed in his life before and it had been freedom that had come not so much from any change of rules but rather from his own attitude to the family simply he had wanted to do certain things and he had done them and the family had stood aside he began to be aware that he had only to push and things gave way a dangerous knowledge and its coming marks a period in one's life he seemed too during this summer to have left his sisters definitely behind him and to stand much more alone than he had done before the only person in his world whom he felt that he would like to know better was uncle samuel and that argued on his part a certain tendency towards rebellion and individuality he was no longer rude to aunt amy although he hated her just as he had always done she did not seem any longer a question that mattered his attitude to his whole family now was independent indeed he was in reality now beginning to live his independent life he was perhaps too young to be sent off to school by himself although in those days for a boy of eight to be plunged without any help but a friendly word of warning into the stormy seas of private school life was common enough nevertheless his father conscious that the child's life had been hitherto spent almost entirely among women sent him every morning during these last weeks at home down to the curate of st martin's in the market to learn a few words of latin an easy sum or two and the rudiments of spelling this young curate the rev wilfred somerset recently of emmanuel college cambridge had but two ideas in his head the noble game of cricket and the jolly qualities of mr surtees's novels he was stout and strong red-faced and thick in the leg always smoking a large black-looking pipe and wearing trousers very short and tight he did not strike jeremy with fear but he was nevertheless an influence jeremy apparently amused him intensely he would roar with laughter at nothing at all smack his thigh and shout good for you young un whatever that might mean and jeremy gazing at him at his pipe and his trousers liking him rather but not sufficiently in awe to be really impressed would ask him questions that seemed to him perfectly simple and natural but that nevertheless amused the rev wilfred so fundamentally that he was unable to give them an intelligible answer undoubtedly this encouraged jeremy's independence he walked to and fro the curate's lodging by himself and was able to observe many interesting things on the way sometimes late in the afternoon he would have some lesson that he must take to his master who as he lodged at the bottom of orange street was a very safe and steady distance from the coals of course aunt amy objected you allow jeremy all by himself into the street at night and he's only eight really you're so strange well in the first place said mrs cole mildly it isn't night it's afternoon in the second place it's only just down the street and jeremy's most obedient always as you know amy i'm sure that mr somerset is wild said aunt amy my dear amy why you've only got to look at his face it's uh, flashy that's what i call it oh that isn't the sort of man who'll do jeremy harm said mrs cole with a mother's wisdom certainly he did jeremy no harm at all he taught him nothing not even mensa and how to spell receive and apple the only thing he did was to encourage jeremy's independence and this was done in the first place by the walks to and fro he had only been going to mr somerset's a day or two when the announcements of the fair appeared on the walls of the town 
he could not help but see them there was a large queue on the boarding halfway down orange street just opposite the doctor's a poster with a coloured picture of Woomwell's circus a fine affair with spangled ladies jumping through hoops elephants sitting on stools tigers prowling a clown cracking a whip and best of all a gentleman with an anxious face and a scanty but elegant costume balanced above a gazing multitude on a tightrope there was also a bill of the fair setting forth that there would be a cattle market races roundabout swings wrestling boxing fat women dwarfs and the two-headed giant from the caucasus during a whole week once a day jeremy read this bill from the top to the bottom at the end of the week he could repeat it all by heart he asked mr somerset whether he was going oh i shall slip along one evening i've no doubt replied that gentleman but it's a bore a whole week of it upsets one's work it needn't said jeremy if you stay indoors this amused mr somerset immensely he laughed a great deal we always have to said jeremy rather hurt we're not allowed farther than the garden ah but i'm older than you are said mr somerset it was the same with me once and what did you do did you go all the same you bet i did said the red-faced hero more intent on his reminiscences than on the effect that this might have on the morals of his pupil jeremy waited then for the parental command that was always issued it was now children you must promise me never to go outside the house this week unless you have asked permission first and then and on no account to speak to any stranger about anything whatever and then don't look out of the back windows mind from the extreme corners of the bedroom windows you could see a patch of the meadow whereon the gypsy van settled these commands had been as regular as the fair and always of course the children had promised obedience jeremy told his conscience that if this year he gave his promise he would certainly keep it he wondered at the same time whether he might not possibly manage to be out of the house when the commands were issued he formed a habit of suddenly slipping out of the room when he saw his father's mouth assuming the shape of a command he took the utmost care not to be alone with his father but he need not have been alarmed this year no command appeared perhaps mr cole thought that it was no longer necessary it was obvious that the children were not to go and they were after all old enough now to think for themselves or perhaps it was that mr cole had other things on his mind he was changing curates just then and a succession of white-faced soft voice and loud-booted young men were appearing at the cole's hospitable table here's this tiresome fair come round again said mrs cole wicked said aunt amy with an envious shudder satan finds work indeed in this town i don't suppose it's worse than anywhere else said mrs cole on the late afternoon of the day before the opening jeremy on his way to mr somerset's caught the tail end of Woomwell's circus procession moving in misty splendour across the market he could see but little although he stood on the pedestal of a lamp-post but britannia rocking high in the air flashing her silver sceptre in the evening air and followed by two enormous and melancholy elephants caught his gaze strains of a band lingered about him he entered mr somerset's in a frenzy of excitement but he said nothing he felt that mr somerset would laugh at him he returned to his home that night haunted by britannia he ate britannia for his supper he had britannia for his dreams and he greeted rose as britannia the next morning when she called him early upon that day there were borne into the heart of the house strains of the fair it was no use whatever to close the windows lock the doors and read divinity the strains persisted a heavenly murmur rising at moments into a muffled shriek or a jumbling shout hanging about the walls as a romantic echo dying upon the air a chastened wail 
no use for mr cole to say we must behave as though the fair was not for a whole week it would be there and every one knew it jeremy did not mean to be disobedient but after that glimpse of britannia he knew what he would do three it had at first been thought advisable that jeremy should not go to mr somerset's during fair week perhaps mr somerset could come to the coles no he was very sorry he must be in his rooms at that particular hour in case parishioners should need his advice or assistance pity for him to miss all this week especially as there will be only four days left after that i am really anxious for him to have a little grounding in latin mrs cole smiled confidently i think jeremy is to be trusted he would never do anything that you wouldn't like mr cole was not so sure he's not quite so obedient as i should wish he shows an independence however after some hesitation it was decided that jeremy might be trusted but even after that he was never put upon his honour if i don't promise i needn't mind he said to himself and waited breathlessly but nothing came only aunt amy said i hope you don't speak to little boys in the street jeremy to which he replied scornfully of course not he investigated his money-box removing the top with a tin opener he found that he had there three shillings three and a half pence a large sum and enough to give him a royal time mary caught him oh jeremy what are you doing just counting my money he said with would-be carelessness you're going to the fair she whispered breathlessly he frowned how could she know she always knew everything perhaps he whispered back but if you tell any one i'll of course i won't tell she replied deeply offended this little conversation strengthened his purpose he had not admitted to himself that he was really going now he knew wednesday would be the night on wednesday evenings his father had a service which prevented him from returning home until half-past eight he would go to somerset's at half-past four and would be expected home at half-past six there would be no real alarm about him until his father's return from church and he could therefore be sure of two hours bliss for the consequences he did not care at all he was going to do no harm to any one or anything they would be angry perhaps but that would not hurt him and in any case he was going to school next week no one at school would mind whether he had been to the fair or no he felt aloof and apart as though no one could touch him he would not have minded simply going into them all and saying i'm off to the fair the obvious drawback to that would have been that he would have been shut up in his room and then they might make him give his word he would not break any promises when wednesday came it was a lovely day out in the field just behind the coles house they were burning a huge bonfire of dead leaves at first only a heavy column of grey smoke rose then flames broke through little thin golden flames like paper then a sudden fierce red orange shot out and went licking up into the air until it faded like tumbling water against the sunlight on the outer edge of the bonfire there was thin grey smoke through which you could see as through glass the smell was heavenly and even through closed windows the crackling of the burnt leaves could be heard the sight of the bonfire excited jeremy it seemed to him a signal of encouragement a spur to perseverance all the morning the flames crackled and the men came with wheelbarrows full of leaves and emptied them in thick heaps upon the fire at each emptying the fire would be for a moment beaten and only the white thick malicious smoke would come through then a little spit of flame another another then a thrust like a golden hand stretching out then a fine towering quivering splendour under the full noonday sun the fire was pale and so unreal weak and sickly that one was almost ashamed to look at it but as the afternoon passed it again gathered strength and with the faint dusky evening it was a giant once more you come along it said to jeremy 
Come along, come along. I'm going to Mr. Somerset's mother, he said, putting two exercise books and a very new and shining blue Latin book together. Are you, dear? I suppose you're safe? Mrs. Cole asked, looking through the drawing-room window. Oh, it's all right, said Jeremy. Well, I think it is, said Mrs. Cole. The street seems quite empty. Don't speak to any odd-looking men, will you? Oh, that's all right, he said again. He walked down Orange Street, his books under his arm, the three shillings, three and a half pence in his pocket. The street was quite deserted, swimming in a cold, pale light. The trees, the houses, the church, the garden walls, sharp and black. The street, dim and precipitous, tumbling forward into the blue, whence lights, one, two, three, now a little bunch together, came pricking out. The old woman opened the door when he rang Mr. Somerset's bell. "'Master's been called away,' she said in her croaking voice. "'A burial. He ain't had time to let you know. Tell the little gentleman,' he said. "'I'm sorry.' "'All right,' said Jeremy. "'Thank you.' He descended the steps, then stood where he was in the street, looking up and down. Who could deny that it was all being arranged for him? He felt more than ever like God, as he looked proudly about him. Everything served his purpose. The jingling of the money in his pocket reminded him that he must waste no more time. He started off. Even his progress through the town seemed wonderful, quite unattended at last, as he had always all his life longed to be. So soon as he left Orange Street and entered the market, he was caught into a great crowd. It was all stirring and humming with a noise such as the bonfire had all day been making. It was his first introduction to the world. He had never been in a large crowd before, and it is not to be denied but that his heart beat thick and his knees trembled a little. But he pulled himself together. Who was he to be afraid? But the books under his arm were a nuisance. He suddenly dropped them in amongst the legs and boots of the people. There were many interesting sights to be seen in the marketplace, but he could not stay, and he found himself soon, to his own surprise, slipping through the people as quietly and easily as though he had done it all his days only always he kept his hand on his money lest that should be stolen and his adventure suddenly come to nothing he knew his way very well and soon he was at the end of finch street which in those days opened straight into fields and hedges even now so little has polchester grown in thirty years the fields and hedges are not very far away here there was a stile with a large wooden fence on either side of it, and a red-faced man saying, "'Pay your sixpence now. Come along. Pay your sixpence now.' Crowds of people were passing through the stile, jostling one another, pressing and pushing, but all apparently in good temper, for there was a great deal of laughter and merriment. From the other side of the fence came a torrent of sound, so discordant and so tumultuous that it was impossible to separate the elements of it from one another. Screams, shrieks, the bellowing of animals, and the monotonous rise and fall of scraps of tune, several bars of one and then bars of another, and then everything lost together in the general babble. And to the right of him Jerry could see, not very far away, quiet fields with cows grazing and the dark grave wood on the horizon would he venture for a moment his heart failed him a wave of something threatening and terribly powerful seemed to come out to him through the stile and the people who were passing in looked large and fierce then he saw two small boys their whole bearing one of audacious boldness push through he was not going to be beaten he followed a man with a back like a wall. One, please, he said. Come along now. Pay your sixpence, pay your sixpence, cried the man. He was through. He stepped at once into something that had for him all the elements of the most terrifying and enchanting of fairy tales. He was planted, it seems, in a giant world. At first he could see nothing but the high and thick bodies of the people who moved on every side of him. He peered under shoulders, he was lost among legs and arms, 
he walked suddenly into waistcoat buttons and was flung thence on to walking sticks but it was if he had known it the most magical hour of all for him to have chosen it was the moment when the sun sinking behind the woods and hills leaves a faint white crystal sky and a world transformed in an instant from sharp outlines and material form into coloured mist and rising vapour the fair also was transformed putting forward all its lights and becoming after the glaring tawdriness of the day a place of shadow and sudden circles of flame and dim obscurity lights even as jeremy watched sprang into the air wavered faltered hesitated then rocked into a steady glow only shifting a little with the haze on either side of him were rough wooden stalls and these were illuminated with gas which sizzled and hissed like angry snakes the stalls were covered with everything invented by man here a sweet stall with thick sticky lumps of white and green and red glass bottles of bull's eyes and peppermints thick slabs of almond toffee and pink coconut icing boxes of round chocolate creams and sticks of licorice lumps of gingerbread with coloured pictures stuck upon them saffron buns plum cakes in glass jars and chains of little sugary biscuits hanging on long red strings there was the old clothes stall with trousers and coats and waistcoats all shabby and lanky swinging beneath the gas and piles of clothes on the boards all nondescript and unhappy and faded there was the stall with the farm implements and the medicine stall and the flower stall and the vegetable stall and many many others each place had his or her guardian vociferous red-faced screaming out the wares lowering the voice to cajole raising it again to draw back a retreating customer carrying on suddenly an intimate conversation with the next-door shopkeeper laughing quarrelling arguing to jeremy it was a world of giant heights and depths behind the stalls behind the lane down which he moved was an uncertain glory a threatening peril he fancied that strange animals moved there he thought he heard a lion roar and an elephant bellow the din of the cellars all about him made it impossible to tell what was happening beyond there only the lights and bells shouts and cries confusing smells and a great roar of distant voices he almost wished that he had not come he felt so very small and helpless he wondered whether he could find his way out again and looking back he was for a moment terrified to see that the stream of people behind him shut him in so that he could not see the stile nor the wooden barrier nor the red-faced man pushed forward he found himself at the end of the lane and standing in a semicircular space surrounded by strange-looking booths with painted pictures upon them and in front of them platforms with wooden steps running up to them then so unexpectedly that he gave a little scream a sudden roar burst out behind him he turned and indeed the world seemed to have gone mad a moment ago there had been darkness and dim shadow now suddenly there was a huge whistling tossing circle of light and flame and from the centre of this a banging brazen cymbal-clashing scream issued a scream that through its strident shrillness he recognised as a tune that he knew a tune often whistled by jim at cow farm and her golden hair was hanging down her back whence the tune came he could not tell from the very belly of the flaming monster it seemed but as he watched he saw that the huge circle whirled ever faster and faster and that up and down on the flame of it coloured horses rose and fell vanishing from light to darkness from darkness to light and seeming of their own free will and motion to dance to the thundering music it was the most terrific thing that he had ever seen the most terrific thing he stood there his cap on the back of his head his legs apart his mouth open forgetting utterly the crowd thinking nothing of time or danger or punishment he gazed with his whole body 
as his eyes grew more accustomed to the glare of the hissing gas he saw that in the centre figures were painted standing on the edge of a pillar that revolved without pause there was a woman with flaming red cheeks a gold dress and dead white dusty arms a man with a golden crown and a purple robe but a broken nose and a minstrel with a harp the woman and the king moved stiffly their arms up and down that they might strike instruments one a cymbal and the other a drum but it was finally the horses that caught jeremy's heart half of them at least were without riders and the empty ones went round pathetically envying the more successful ones and dancing to the music as though with an effort one especially moved jeremy's sympathy he was a fine horse rather fresher than the others with a coal-black mane and great black bulging eyes his saddle was of gold and his trappings of red as he went around he seemed to catch jeremy's eye and to beg him to come to him he rode more securely than the rest rising nobly like a horse of fine breeding falling again with an implication of restrained force as though he would say i have only to let myself go and there my word you would see where i get to his bold black eyes turned beseechingly to jeremy surely it was not only a trick of the waving gas the boy drew closer and closer never moving his gaze from the horses who had hitherto been whirling at a bacchanalian pace but now as at some sudden secret command suddenly slackened hesitated fell into a gentle jog-trot then scarcely rose scarcely fell were suddenly still jeremy saw what it was that you did if you wanted a ride a stout dirty man came out amongst the horses and resting his hands on their backs as though they were less than nothing to him shouted now's your chance ladies and gents now ladies and gents come along up come along up the ride of your life now a half penny a time a half penny a time and the finest ride of your life people began to mount the steps that led on to the platform where the horses stood a woman then a man and a boy then two men then two girls giggling together then a man and a girl and the stout fellow shouted come along up come along hup now ladies and gents a half penny a ride come along hup jeremy noticed then that the fine horse with the black mane had stopped close beside him impossible to say whether the horse had indeed intended it or no he was staring now in front of him with the innocent stupid gaze that animals can assume when they do not wish to give themselves away but jeremy could see that he was taking it for granted that jeremy understood the affair if you're such a fool as not to understand he seemed to say well then i don't want you jeremy gazed and the reproach in those eyes was more than he could endure and at any moment someone else might settle himself on that beautiful back there that stupid fat giggling girl no she had moved elsewhere he could endure it no longer and with a thumping heart clutching a scalding penny in a red-hot hand he mounted the steps one ride little gentleman here you are old on now oh you wants that one do yer eight you are yer pays your money and yer takes your choice he lifted jeremy up put your arms round his neck now he won't bite yer bite him indeed jeremy felt as he clutched the cool head and let his hand slide over the stiff black mane that he knew more about that horse than his owner did he seemed to feel beneath him the horse's response to his clutching knees the head seemed to rise for a moment and nod to him and the eyes to say it's all right i'll look after you i'll give you the best ride of your life he felt indeed that the gaze of the whole world was upon him but he responded to it proudly staring boldly around him as though he had been seated on merry-go-rounds all his days perhaps some in the gaping crowd knew him and were saying why there's the reverend cole's kid never mind he was above scandal from where he was he could see the fair lifted up and translated into a fantastic splendour 
nothing was certain nothing defined above him a canopy of evening sky with circles and chains of stars mixed with the rosy haze of the flame of the fair opposite him was the palace of the two-headed giant from the caucasus a huge man as portrayed in the picture hanging on his outer walls a giant naked save for a bearskin with one head black and one yellow and white protruding teeth in both mouths next to him was the fortune-tellers and outside this a little man with a hump beat a drum then there was the theatre of tragedy and mirth with a poster on one side of the door portraying a lady drowning in the swiftest of rivers but with the prospect of being saved by a stout gentleman who leaned over from the bank and grasped her hair then there was the chamber of the fat lady and the six little dwarfs and the entry to this was guarded by a dirty sour-looking female who gnashed her teeth at a hesitating public before whom with a splendid indifference to appearance she consumed out of a piece of newspaper her evening meal all these things were in jeremy's immediate vision and beyond them was a haze that his eyes could not penetrate it held he knew wild beasts because he could hear quite clearly from time to time the lion and the elephant and the tiger it held music because from somewhere through all the noise and confusion the tune of a band penetrated it held buyers and sellers and treasures and riches and all the inhabitants of the world surely all the world must be here to-night and then beyond the haze there were the silent and mysterious gypsy caravans dark with their little square windows and their coloured walls and their round wheels and the smell of wood fires and the noise of hissing kettles and horses cropping the grass and around them the still night world with the thick woods and the dark river he did not see it all as he sat on his horse he was as yet too young but he could feel the contrast between the din and glare around him and the silence and dark beyond and afterwards looking back he knew that he had found in that same contrast the very heart of romance as it was he simply clutched his horse's beautiful head and waited for the ride to begin they were off he felt his horse quiver under him he saw the mansions of the two-headed giant and the fat lady slip to the right the light seemed to swing like the skirt of someone's dress upwards across the floor and from the heart of the golden woman and the king and the minstrel a scream burst forth as though they were announcing the end of the world after that he had no clear idea as to what occurred he was swung into space and all the life that had been so stationary the booths the lights the men and women the very stars went swinging with him as though to cheer him on the horse under him galloped before and the faster he galloped the wilder was the music and the dizzier the world he was exultant omnipotent supreme he had long known that this glory was somewhere if it could only be found all his days he seemed to have been searching for it he beat his horse's neck he drove his legs against his sides go on go on go on he cried faster 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 the strangest things seemed to rise to his notice and then fall again a peaked policeman's hat flowers a sudden flame of gas the staring eyes and dead-white arms of the golden woman the flying forms of the horses in front of him all the world was on horseback all the world was racing higher and higher faster and faster he saw some one near him rise on to his horse's back and stand on it waving his arms he would like to have done that but he found that he was part of his horse as though he had been glued to it he shouted he cried aloud he was so happy that he thought of no one and nothing the flame danced about him in a circle he seemed to rise so high that there was a sudden stillness he was in the very heart of the stars then came the supreme moment when as he had always known that one day he would be he was master of the world then like lucifer he fell slowly the stars receded the music slackened people rocked on to their feet again the two-headed giant slipped back once more into his place 
he saw the sinister lady still devouring her supper women looking up at him gaped his horse gave a last little leap and died this marvellous experience he repeated four times and every time with an ecstasy more complete than the last he rushed to a height he fell he rushed again he fell and at every return to a sober life his one intention was instantly to be off on his steed once more he was about to start on his fifth journey he had paid his halfpenny he was sitting forward with his hands on the black mane his eyes staring were filled already with the glory that he knew was coming to him his cheeks were crimson his hat on the back of his head his hair flying he heard a voice quiet and cool and a little below him but very near jeremy jeremy come off that you've got to go home he looked down and saw his uncle samuel four it was all over he knew at once that it was all over as he slipped down from his dear horse he gave the glossy black mane one last pat then with a little sigh he found his feet stumbled over the wooden steps and was at his uncle's side uncle samuel looked queer enough with a squashy black hat a black cloak flung over his shoulders and a large cherry wood pipe in his mouth jeremy looked up at him defiantly well said uncle samuel sarcastically it's nothing to you i suppose that the town crier is at this moment ringing his bell for you up and down the market-place does father know jeremy asked quickly he does answered uncle samuel jeremy cast one last look around the place the merry-go-round was engaged once more upon its wild course the horses rising and falling the golden woman clashing the cymbals the minstrel striking with his dead eyes fixed upon space his harp all about men were shouting the noise of the coconut stores of the circus of the band of the hucksters and the charlatans the crying of children the laughter of women all the noise of the fair bathed jeremy up to his forehead he swam in it for the last time he tried to catch one last glimpse of his coal-black charger then with a sigh he said turning to his uncle i suppose we'd better be going yes i suppose we had said uncle samuel they threaded their way through the fair passed the wooden stile and were once again in the streets dark and ancient under the moon with all the noise and glare behind them jeremy was thinking to himself it doesn't matter what father does or how angry he is that was worth it it was strange how little afraid he was only a year ago to be punished by his father had been a terrible thing now since his mother's illness in the summer his father had seemed to have no influence over him did they bend you or did you just come yourself uncle asked jeremy i happened to be taking the air in that direction said uncle samuel i hope you didn't come away before you wanted to said jeremy politely i did not said his uncle is father very angry asked jeremy it's more than likely he may be the town crier's expensive i didn't think they'd know exclaimed jeremy i meant to get back in time your father didn't go to church said uncle samuel so your sins were quickly discovered jeremy said nothing just as they were climbing orange street he said uncle samuel i think i'll be a horse trainer oh will you well before you train horses you've got to train yourself think of others besides yourself a fine state you've put your mother into to-night jeremy looked distressed she'd know if i was dead someone would come and tell her he said but i'll tell mother i'm sorry but i won't tell father he added why not asked uncle samuel because he'll make such a fuss and i'm not sorry he never told me not to no but you knew you hadn't to i'm very good at obeying exclaimed jeremy if someone says something but if someone doesn't there isn't any one to obey uncle samuel shook his head you'll be a bit of a prig my son if you aren't careful he said 
"'I think it will be splendid to be a horse-trainer,' said Jeremy. "'It was a lovely horse to-night, and I only spent a shilling. I had three and threepence halfpenny.' At the door of their house Uncle Samuel stopped and said, "'Look here, young man. They say it's time you went to school, and I don't think they're far wrong. There are things wiser heads than yours can understand, and you'd better take their word for it. In the future, if you want to go running off somewhere, you'd better content yourself with my studio and make a mess there. Oh, may I? cried Jeremy, delighted. That studio had been always a forbidden place to them, and had, therefore, its air of enchanting mystery. Won't you really mind my coming? he asked. I shall probably hate it, answered his uncle, but there's nothing I wouldn't do for the family. The boy walked to his father's study and knocked on the door. He did have, then, at the sound of that knock, a moment of panic. The house was so silent, and he knew so well what would follow the opening of the door. And the worst of it was that he was not sorry in the least. He seemed to be indifferent and superior, as though no punishment could touch him. "'Come in,' said his father. He pushed open the door and entered. The scene that followed was grave and sad, and yet, in the end, strangely unimpressive. His father talked too much. As he talked, Jeremy's thought would fly back to the coal-black horse and to that moment when he had seemed to fly into the very heart of the stars. "'Oh, Jeremy, how could you?' said his father. "'Is obedience nothing to you? Do you know how God punishes disobedience?' think what a terrible thing is a disobedient man. Then, on a lower scale, I really don't know what to do with you. You knew that you were not to go near that wicked place. You never said, interrupted Jeremy. Nonsense. You knew well enough. You will break your mother's heart. I'll tell her I'm sorry, he interrupted quickly. If you are really sorry, said his father, "'I'm not sorry I went,' said Jeremy, "'but I'm sorry I hurt mother.' The end of it was that Jeremy received six strokes on the hand with a ruler. Mr. Cole was not good at this kind of thing, and twice he missed Jeremy's hand altogether, and looked very foolish. It was not an edifying scene. Jeremy left the room, his head high, his spirit obstinate, and his father remained, puzzled, distressed at a loss, anxious to do what was right, but unable to touch his son at all. Jeremy went up to his room. He opened his window and looked out. He could smell the burnt leaves of the bonfire. There was no flame now, but he fancied that he could see a white shadow where it had been. Then on the wind came the music of the fair. tum to tum tum to tum whir 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 hang bang Somewhere an owl cried, and then another owl answered. He rubbed his sore hand against his trousers, then thinking of his black horse, he smiled. He was a free man. In a week he would go to school, then he would go to college, then he would be a horse trainer. He was in bed. Faintly into the dark room stole the scent of the bonfire and the noise of the fair. Tum to tum, tum to tum. He was asleep, riding on a giant charger across boundless plains. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of Jeremy by Hugh Walpole. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12. Hamlet Waits. One, The last day, Jeremy, suddenly waking, realized this with a confusion of feeling as though he were sentenced to the dentist's, but, oddly enough, looked forward to his visit. Going to school, one had, of course, long ago perceived, was a mixed business, but the balance was now greatly to the good. It was a step in the right direction towards liberty and freedom, thank heaven. No one in the family was likely to make a fuss about his departure, unless it were possibly Mary, and she had, of late, kept very much to herself, and worried him scarcely at all. 
Indeed, he felt guilty about Mary. He was fond of her, really. Funny kid. If only she didn't make fusses. Yes, it was unlike his family to make fusses. He realized that very plainly today. Everyone went about his or her daily business with no implication whatever that something extraordinary was going to happen tomorrow. Perhaps they were all secretly relieved that he was off. He had been, he knew, something of a failure during these last months, one trouble after another, the scandal of his visit to the fair as the grand finale. He felt that there was, in some way, some injustice in all this. He had no desire to be bad or rebellious. On the contrary, he wished to do all that his elders ordered him, but he could not prevent the rising of his own individuality, which showed him quite clearly whether he should do a thing or no. It was as though something inside him pushed him, whereas they, all of them, only checked him. He loved his mother best, and he was secretly disappointed to find how ordinary an affair his departure was to her. He realized, with a perception that was beyond his years, that the infant Barbara was now rapidly occupying the position as center of the family that he had held. Barbara, everyone declared, was a charming baby. The house revolved, to some extent, round Barbara. But then again this isolation was entirely his own fault. During the summer holidays he had gone his own way, and had wanted no one but Hamlet as his companion. He had no right to complain. After breakfast he did not quite know what to do, and it was obvious also that no one knew quite what to do with him. Mrs. Cole said, "'Jeremy, dear, Ponting has never sent that letter paper and envelopes that he promised, and Father must have them to-day. Would you go down and bring them back with you? Father will write a note.' No one seemed to realize what an abysmal change from earlier conditions this casual sentence marked. That he should go to Footings, which was on the farther side of the town, alone and unattended, seemed to no one peculiar. And yet, only six months ago, a walk without Miss Jones was undreamt of. And before her, no more than nine months back, there was the jam-pot. He was delighted to go, but of course he did not show his delight. All he said was, Yes, mother. He was in his new clothes, stiff black jacket, black knickerbockers, black stockings, black boots. No more navy suits with white braid and whistles. Perhaps he would see the dean's earnest. It was his most urgent desire. He started off, accompanied by a barking, bounding Hamlet, who showed no perception of the calamity that threatened to tumble upon him. For Jeremy, leaving Hamlet was a dreadful affair. In three months a dog can change more swiftly than a human being, and Hamlet, although not a supremely greedy dog, had shown of late increasing signs of love of good food, and a regrettable tendency to fawn upon the giver of the same, even when it was Aunt Amy. Jeremy had checked this tendency, and had issued punishments when necessary, and Hamlet had accepted the same without a murmur. So long as Jeremy was there, Hamlet's character was secure, but now, during this long absence, anything might happen. There was no one to whom Jeremy might leave him, no one who had the slightest idea what a dog should do and what he should not. These melancholy thoughts filled Jeremy's mind when he started upon his walk, but soon he was absorbed by his surroundings. He realized, even more drastically than the facts warranted, that he was making his farewell to the town. He was not making his final farewell, he would not make that until his death, and perhaps not then, but he was making farewell to some of his sense of his wonder in it, only not, thank God, to the sense of wonder itself. As he went, he met the daily figures of all his walks, and he could not help but speculate on their realization of the great change that was coming to him. It was absurd to suppose that they were saying to themselves, "'Ah, there's young Jeremy Cole. He's off to school to-morrow. I wonder what he's feeling about it.' No, that was incredible, and yet they must realize something of the adventure. 
he on his part stared at them with a new interest they had before shared in the inevitable background without individuality but now that he was leaving them and they would grow as it were without his permission he was forced to grant them independence at the bottom of orange street he met mr dawson the cathedral organist he was a little plump man in a very neat grey suit a shiny top hat and very small spats he was always dressed in the same fashion and carried a black music case under his arm he had an eternal interest for jeremy because whenever he was mentioned the phrase was poor little mr dawson why he was to be pitied jeremy did not know he looked spruce and bright enough and generally whistled to himself as he walked but poor was an exciting adjective and jeremy when he passed him felt a little shudder of drama run down his spine outside poole's bookshop there was of course mr mockridge mr mockridge was the poorest of the canons so poor that it had become a proverb in the place as poor as mr mockridge and also another proverb i am afraid from the same source as dirty as mr mockridge he was a very long thin man with a big pointing nose colored red not from indigestion and most certainly not from drink but simply i think because the wind caught it his passion was for books and he might be seen every afternoon between three and four o'clock bending over Poole's two-pence box a dirty handkerchief flying out of the tail of his long black coat and a green bulging umbrella pointing outwards under his arm to the infinite danger of all the passer-by he was so commonplace a figure to jeremy that on ordinary days he was shrouded by an invisibility of tradition but to-day he was fresh and strange he'll be here to-morrow poking his nose into that box just the same and i shall be then on the outskirts of the market-place jeremy paused and looked about him there was all the usual business of the place the wooden trestles with the flower-pots the apple-woman under her umbrella the empty cattle-pens where the cows and sheep stood on market-days and behind them the dark vaulted arches of the actual market now empty and deserted bathed in sunlight it lay very quiet and still some pigeons pecking at grain a dog or two and children playing around the empty cattle stalls from the hill above the square the cathedral boomed the hour and all the pigeons rose in a flight hovered then slowly settled again jeremy sighed and with a strange pain in his heart that he could not analyze moved up the hill the high street is of course the west end of polchester and in the morning between ten and one every lady in the town may be seen at her shopping it had always been the ambition of the coal children to be taken for their walk up high street in the morning but it was an ambition very rarely gratified because they stopped so often and were always in every one's way and here was jeremy at this gay hour a trolling up the high street all by himself he lifted his head pushed out his chest and looked the world in the face he might meet the dean's earnest at any moment the first people whom he saw were the Misses Cragg, always known, of course, as the Cragg girls. They were perhaps Polchester's most constant and obvious feature. There were four of them, all as yet unmarried, all with brown-red faces and hard straw hats, short skirts, and tremendous voices. Forerunners, in fact, of a type now almost universal they played croquet and lawn tennis were prominent members of the archery club and hunted when their fathers would let them they were terrible dianas to jeremy he had met one of them once at a children's dance and she had whirled him around until with a terrified scream he broke howling from her arms and hid himself in the large bosom of the jam-pot he was always ashamed of this memory and he could never see them without blushing but to-day he seemed less afraid of them and actually when he passed them touched his hat and looked them in the face 
they all smiled and nodded to him and when they had gone he was so deeply astonished at this adventure that he had to stop and consider himself if the crags were nothing to him what might he not face come here hamlet how dare you he ordered in so sharp and military a voice that hamlet who had merely cast a most innocent glance at a disdainful and conceited white poodle looked up at his master with surprise nevertheless his new-found hardihood received in the very midst of his self-congratulation its severest test he stumbled into the very path of the dean's wife mrs dean could never have seemed to any one a large woman but to jeremy she had always been a terror she was thick and hard like a wall and wore the kind of silken clothes that rustled like the whispering of a whole meeting of frightened clergymen's wives as she moved she had a hard condemnatory voice and she spoke as though she were addressing an assembly but worst of all she had black beetling eyebrows and these frightened jeremy into fits he did not of course know that the poor lady suffered continually from nervous headaches he suddenly heard that voice in his ear good morning jeremy and where are you off to so early mrs dean was never so awful as when she was jolly and jeremy caught up by the eyebrows as though they had been hooks and hung thus in mid-air for all the street to laugh at nearly lost his command of his natural tongue he found his voice just in time to ponting he said all alone ah no i see you have your little dog nice little dog and how's your mother she's quite well thank you that's right that's right we haven't seen you lately you must come up to tea with your sisters i'm afraid you won't find ernest he's gone back to school but i dare say you're not too big to play with little girls jeremy felt some triumph in his heart i'm going to school to-morrow he said but if he expected mrs dean to be pitiful at this statement he was greatly mistaken are you indeed such a pity you couldn't have gone with ernest but he'd be senior to you of course good-bye good-bye give my love to your mother and she pounded her way along she's a beastly woman anyway thought jeremy i wish i'd found something to say to her i wonder whether she knows i knocked ernest down in the summer and trod on him but the sight of the high street soon restored his equanimity on other occasions he had been pushed through it either by the jampot or miss jones so rapidly that he could gather only the most fleeting impressions to-day he could linger and linger he did the two nicest shops were manning's the hairdresser's and ponting's the bookshop but rose the grocers and coulters the confectioners were very good mr manning was an artist he did not simply put a simpering bust with an elaborate head of hair in his window and leave it at that he did indeed place there a smiling lady with a wonderful jewelled comb and a radiant row of teeth but around this he built up a magnificent world of silver brushes tortoise-shell combs essences and perfumes and powders jars and bottles and boxes manning was the finest artist in the town ponting at the top of the street just at the corner of the close was an artist also but in quite another fashion ponting was the best established most sacred and serious bookseller in the county in the days when the new waverley was the sensation of the moment mr ponting grandfather of the present mr ponting had been in quite constant correspondence with mr southey and mr coleridge and had once when on a visit to london spoken to the great lord byron himself this tradition of aristocracy remained and the present mr ponting always advised the bishop what to read and was consulted by mrs lamb our only authoress on questions of publishers and editions and such technical points for all this jeremy at his present stage of interest 
would have cared nothing even had he known it but what he did care for were the rows of calf-bound books with little ridges of gold that made a fine wall across the window with an old print of the cathedral and the close in the middle of them inside pontings there was a hush as of the study and the church combined it was a rather dark shop with rows and rows of books disappearing into the ceiling and one grave and unnaturally old young man behind the counter jeremy did not know what he should do about hamlet so he brought him inside only to discover to his horror that the fiercest of all the canons canon waterbury held the floor of the shop canon waterbury had a black beard and a biting tongue he had once warned jeremy off the cathedral grass in a voice of thunder and jeremy had never forgotten it he glared now and pulled his beard but hamlet fortunately behaved well and the old young man discovered jeremy's notepaper within a very short period then suddenly the canon spoke dogs should not be inside shops he said as though he were condemning someone to death i know said jeremy frankly i wanted to tie him up to something and there was nothing to tie him up to what did you bring him out for at all said the canon because he's got to have exercise said jeremy discovering to his own delighted surprise that he was not frightened in the least oh has he i don't know what people keep dogs for and then he stamped out of the shop jeremy regarded this in the light of a victory and marched away his head more in the air than ever he should now have hurried home the midday chimes had rung out and jeremy's duties were performed but he lingered listening to the last notes of the chimes hearing the cries of the cathedral choir boys as they moved across the green to the choir school watching all the people hurry up and down the street ah there was the castle carriage perhaps the old countess was inside it he had only seen her once at some service in the cathedral to which his mother had taken him but she had made a great impression on him with her snow-white hair he had heard people speak of her as a wicked old woman perhaps she was inside the carriage but he only saw the castle coachman and footman and the coronet on the door it rolled slowly up the hill with its fine air of commanding the whole world then it disappeared around the corner of the close jeremy decided then that he would go home across the green and down orchard lane he had a wish to enter the cathedral for a moment such a visit would after all complete the round of his experiences he had never entered the cathedral alone and now as he saw it facing him so vast and majestic and quiet across the sun-drenched green he felt a sudden fear and awe he found a ring and a stone near the west end through which he might fasten hamlet's lead then slowly pushing back the heavy door he passed inside the cathedral was utterly quiet the vast nave stained with reflections of purple and green and ruby was vague and unsubstantial all the little wooden chairs huddled together to the right and left leaving a great path that swept up to the high altar under shafts of light that fell like searchlights from the windows the tombs and the statues peered dimly from the shadow and the great east end window with its deep purple light seemed to draw the whole nave up into its heart and hold it there all was space and silence light and dusk a little doll of a verger moved in the far distance an old woman so quiet that she seemed only a shadow passed him wiping the little chairs with a duster it seemed to jeremy that he had never been in the cathedral before he stood there breathless as though in a moment something must inevitably happen although he did not think of it the moment was one of a sequence that had come to him during the year his entry into the theatre with his uncle his first conversation with the sea captain the hour when his mother had been so ill the evening on the beach when charlotte had been frightened the time when hamlet had been lost and he had slept with him under a tree 
all these moments had been something more than merely themselves had had something behind them or inside them for which simply they stood as words stand for pictures he analyzed of course nothing being a perfectly healthy small boy but if afterwards he looked back these were the moments that he saw as one sees stations in a journey one day he would know for what they stood he simply now waited there as though he expected something to happen thoughts slipped through his mind quite casually whether hamlet were behaving well outside what the old lady did when she was tired of dusting who the stone figure lying near him might be a figure very fine with his ruff and his peaked beard his arms folded his toes pointing upwards whether the body were inside the stone like a mummy or underneath the ground somewhere how strangely different the knave looked now from its sunday show and what fun it would be to run races all the way down and see who could reach the golden angels over the reredos first he felt no reverence and yet a deep reverence no fear but nevertheless awe he was warm and happy and comfortable and yet suddenly giving a little shudder he slipped out into the sunlight released hamlet and started for home two back again in the bosom of his family he felt that they were beginning to be aware of his departure what shall we do this evening jeremy your last evening said his mother everyone looked at him oh i don't know he said uncomfortably just as usual i suppose you're making him feel uncomfortable said aunt amy who loved to explain quite obvious things you want it to be just an ordinary evening dear don't you oh i don't know he said again hating his aunt i don't think that quite the way to speak to your aunt my son said his father we only inquire out of kindness thinking to please you no mary no more friday one helping jeremy might have another as it's his last day i suggest said aunt amy who was determined to be pleasant i don't want any thank you said jeremy although it was treacle pudding which he loved well i think said mrs cole that we'll have high tea at half-past seven and the children shall stay up afterwards and we'll have midshipmen easy jeremy loved his mother intensely at that moment how did she know so exactly what was right she made so little disturbance was so quiet and was never angry and yet she was always right when the others were always wrong she knew that above all things he loved high tea fish pie and boiled eggs and tea and jam and cake a horrible meal that his later judgment would utterly condemn but nevertheless something so cosy and so comfortable that no other meal would ever be able to rival it in those qualities oh that will be lovely he said his face shining all over nevertheless as the afternoon advanced a strange new sense of insecurity unhappiness and forlornness crept increasingly upon him he realized that he had that morning said good-bye to the town and now he felt as though he had in some way hurt or insulted it and all the afternoon he was saying farewell to the house he did not wander from room to room but rather sat up in the schoolroom pretending to mend a fishing-rod which mr monk had given him that summer he did not really care about the rod he was not even thinking of it he heard all the sounds of the house as he sat there he could tell all the clocks that one booming softly the half-hours was his mother's bedroom there was a rattle and a whirr and there came the cuckoo clock on the stairs that was the fast cheap careless chatter of the little clock on the schoolroom mantelpiece there was the whisper of miss jones's watch which she had put on the table to mark the time of mary's sewing by there were all the regular sounds of the house the distant closing of doors deep down in the heart of the house some one was using a sewing machine somewhere voices came up out of the void and faded again some one whistled some one sang his gloom increased 
he was exchanging a world he knew for a world that he did not know and he could not escape the feeling that he was in some way insulting this world that he was leaving he bothered himself all the afternoon with unnecessary stupid affairs to cover his deep discomfort he whistled carelessly and out of tune he poked the fire and walked about he was increasingly aware of hamlet and mary mary was determined so hard that she would show no emotion at all that she was a painful sight to witness she had scarcely spoke to him and only answered in monosyllables if he asked her anything and hamlet had suddenly discovered that the atmosphere of the house was unusual he had expected in the first place to be taken for a walk that afternoon then his master was very busy doing nothing which was most unusual then at tea-time his worst suspicions were confirmed jeremy suddenly made a fuss of him pouring his tea into his saucer giving him a piece of bread and jam and an extra lump of sugar hamlet drank his tea and ate his bread and jam thoughtfully they were very nice but what was the matter he looked up through his hair and discovered that his master's eyes were restless and unhappy and that he was thinking of things that disturbed him he went away to the fire and sitting on his haunches gazing in his metaphysical way at the flames considered the matter jeremy came over to him and drawing him back to him laid his head upon his knee and so held him hamlet did not move save occasionally to sigh and once or twice to snap in a sudden way that he had at an imaginary fly he thought that in all probability his master had been punished for something and in this he was deeply sympathetic never seeing why his master need be punished for anything and resenting the stupidity of human beings with their eternal desire to be in some way or other asserting their authority gradually in front of the hot fire both boy and dog fell asleep jeremy's dreams were confused bewildered distressing he was struggling to find something was always climbing higher and higher to discover it only to be told that in the end he was in the place where he had begun hamlet's dream was of an enormous succulent bone that was pulled away from him so soon as he snapped at it they both awoke with a start to find that it was time for high tea three throughout the evening jeremy was more and more lonely he had never before felt so deep an affection for the family and never been so utterly unable to express it it was as though during the whole year he had by his own will been slipping away from them and now they had gone too far for him to call them back he sat on the floor at his mother's feet while she read midshipman easy it was all so cosy the room was so comfortable with all the familiar pictures and photographs and books and helen and mary diligently sewing and hamlet stretched out in front of the fire his nose on his paws six months ago jeremy would have felt utterly and absolutely part of it now he was outside it and at the same time was inside nothing else it might be that in a week's time he would be so familiar with his new world that he would be as happy as a cricket he did not know he only knew that at this moment he would have given all that he had to fling his arms round his mother's neck to be hugged and kissed and nursed by her and that at the same time he would have died rather than do such a thing the evening came to an end the girls got up and said good-night his mother kissed him holding him perhaps for a moment longer than usual but at that same instant she said oh i must remind ella about the half-past seven breakfast again she always has to be told everything twice the girls went on ahead jeremy and hamlet following close behind jeremy found himself alone in the schoolroom where the fire was very low giving only little spurts and flashes that ran like golden snakes suddenly around the darkness moved by an impulse he went to the toy cupboard and opening it put his hand quite by chance on the toy village the toy village he laid it out and spread it on the floor 
he could not see but he knew every piece by heart and he laid it all out the church and the flower garden and noah's house and the village street the animals and the noahs what centuries ago that birthday was what worlds away how excited he had been and now with a sudden impatient gesture he tumbled the pieces over on their sides then quickly as though he were afraid of the dark went into his bedroom and began to undress four in the morning events moved too quickly for thought he had still the same lonely pain in his heart but now he simply was not given time to consider it his father called him into the study he gave him ten shillings and a new prayer-book jeremy knew that he was trying to come close to him and be a friend of a new kind to him he heard in a distance such words as a new world full of trial and temptation god sees us work at your latin cricket and football prayers every night but he could feel no emotion nothing but terror lest some sudden stupid emotional scene should occur nothing occurred he kissed his father and went then quite suddenly just as he came down in his hat and coat and heard that the cab was there his restraint melted he was free and impulsive and natural he kissed mary telling her you may have my toy village i'd like you to yes rather i mean it he kissed helen and barbara and then held to his mother not caring whether all the world was there to see the old life was going with him he was not leaving it after all the town and the house and all the things to which he had thought that he had said good-bye were going with him hamlet he found the dog struggling to get into the cab that was more than he could stand he was not going to make a fool of himself but the only way to be secure was to get into the cab and hide there he caught hamlet's head gave it a kiss then jumped in catching a last glimpse of the family grouped at the door the servants at the window the old garden with the dead leaves gathered upon it hamlet held struggling in mary's arms he choked down his sobs felt the ten shillings in his pocket then with a mighty resolve to which it seemed that the labors of hercules were as nothing leaned out and waved his hand the cab rolled off hamlet lay down upon the mat just inside the hall door someone tried to pull him away he growled showing his teeth his master had gone out he would wait for his return and no one should move him end of chapter 12 end of jeremy by hugh walpole